Hi there, my name is Michael, and this video is about solving Boolean expressions and about my MegaFave number. So MegaFave Numbers is a YouTube playlist where a bunch of really great math-related channels are sharing their favorite numbers greater than 1 million. They've opened it up to anybody to submit their own. I wasn't really sure I had a favorite number, but then I realized a huge number I think about all the time. It's 614 quadrillion, 889 trillion, 782 billion, 588,491,410, otherwise known as primordial 15. Here's how you construct that number in J, an open source programming language and executable math notation from jsoftware.com. J executes from right to left, so here we have the number 15, the first 15 non-negative integers, the first 15 primes, and their product, literally inserting a multiplication sign between each item in the list. Now, the product of the first n prime numbers is called a primorial. Basically, it's like a factorial, but using only primes. Apparently, there are various interesting features of these things, but this is the one I cared about most. They're square-free numbers. Literally, that means no square numbers evenly divided. But more importantly for me, it means there's only one of each factor. So it's easy to put them into groups without having to worry about duplicates. Of course, any list of unique primes has this property, but if you're going to generate a list of primes, taking them in order seemed to be the simplest way to go about it. So let me explain the problem I wanted to solve that led me to this number. I maintain a program called BEX. It's a Rust library, or crate, for working with Boolean expressions. A Boolean expression is just a function that operates on bits. You have some arbitrary number of input bits and one output bit. Of course, if you want to model a function that needs more than one output bit, you can just make a list of Boolean expressions. Since pretty much any problem can be described this way, you can think of BEX as a general purpose problem solver. And for me, BEX is also an exercise in optimization. I'm always looking for ways to make it faster. Since I'm always trying to make it faster, I'm always changing things. And because I'm always changing things, I want to make sure I don't break anything. And to make sure I don't break anything, I need some problems for it to solve so I can check that it still gets the right answer. So I found myself in search of two main types of problem. First, really small problems that I can solve quickly, so I have some evidence that things are working as I make changes. And second, big problems that take it a long time so that I can really measure the impact of an optimization. The main problems I give to Bex right now for both of those situations have to do with factoring numbers. In general, as far as anyone knows, factoring numbers is a hard problem. But even though this number is fairly huge for us, a modern computer can factor it in a fraction of a second. So that right there is the basic problem I'm asking Bex to solve. The complete problem statement is somewhat more complicated. Instead of all the prime factors, I want to find pairs of factors. So for example, if I divided these prime factors into two boxes, and then took the product of the numbers in, in each box, then this would be one of the pairs I'm looking for. I picked this particular primorial as a benchmark somewhat arbitrarily. It just happens to be the biggest one that will fit into a 64-bit integer. So the full problem specification is to find every pair of 32-bit unsigned integers, let's call them x and y, such that x is less than y and x times y is equal to primorial 15. So as I said, this pair of numbers is one of the answers, but if I move the 29 over to the box on the left, then this fails, both because now the left number is bigger than the right number, but also because the left number is more than 32 bits. Um, so that's what we're looking for. I'm going to go ahead and generate the full list in J real quick, and then we can compare that to how Bex does it. The trick is to find every possible way to divide our list of primes into two groups. That part's easy. You just count to 2 to the 15th in binary. Let's use a smaller example that actually fits on the screen. So here's our primorial. Let's give that 15 a name and drop it all the way down to 3. We don't need the product anymore. Uh, now next to that, let's count to n, or rather 2 to the n in binary. So now we can use these patterns to group the primes. Uh, so far, I've been inserting a semicolon between things to create boxes. If you only want one box, you can use the less than sign without a right-hand argument. That lets us write this. The forward slash and dot together say something like, use the items on the left as group labels for the items on the right and then apply this boxing function to each group. The double quote and the one mean to do that at rank one, uh, which means to do it for every row. So basically, for each row on the left, separate the primes into two boxes. Unfortunately, you can see it duplicates the list. That's because the second half of these bit patterns is exactly the same as the first half with all the bits inverted. So we really only want the first half. But now each row on the left is shorter than the list of primes, so we get a length error. Uh, but we can just put a zero on the left of each row. 
Uh, and if we plug that in, we now have all unique partitions of the factors of primordial 3 into two groups. Um, and we can do the same thing with primordial 15. To get the unique pairs of factors, we take the product of the numbers in each box. So now we have every pair of positive integers that multiply to primordial 15. We still need to select the rows where both numbers are less than 2 to the 32nd power. Uh, so first, let's get rid of these boxes. And now, I'm going to paste in a definition. This is too much J to explain in detail right now, uh, but it literally says select using the indices where all the items on a row are less than this number, or in other words, uh, restrict the whole table to 32-bit unsigned in integers. So here we go. Uh, and if we count the results, we have exactly 3,827 unique pairs of 32-bit numbers that factor into our number. And that's down from the 2 to the 14th we started with because of this 2 to the n minus 1. Finally, let's sort each line so the smaller number is always on the left. Um, and that's the answer we're looking for. Just to make it look nice, we'll sort one more time without the rank 1 suffix, uh, and that puts the smallest pairs at the top. Okay, so that wasn't too hard from a math point of view. Let's see how Bex does. After a little formatting, those numbers and the primordial itself go into this Rust file, and that becomes our test case. Uh, if you clone the repo, it's in examples solve bdd-solve.rs. Um, and if you scroll to the bottom of that file, you'll see this line. It's a macro that says, use something called a BDD to find all pairs of 32-bit factors of the 64-bit number K, uh, and then check that the answers match this list. So before we talk about how it's going to do that, let's just run this and see what happens. Looks like we're off to a good start. Okay, I paused the scrolling for a second so we could read this. All these AND and XOR lines are substitution steps that the solver's performing. But the main thing to watch are these step whatever of 7997 lines. Apparently, we're already at 2.3%. Unfortunately, that number is fairly misleading. The way the current solver works, it knows how many quote-unquote steps it will take to construct the solution, but it doesn't know how long each step is going to take. And you can see it's already slowing down. Even more unfortunately, it's pretty much going to keep slowing down. I think the last time I let it run, it went for about three days, and then it finally ran out of memory and crashed. By the way, this is a fairly high-end machine. It's got six cores and 12 logical CPUs, and as you can see, Bex uh, puts all 12 of them to work. It doesn't really max each CPU out yet, but it's still throwing a lot of processing power at this problem. So yeah, at the moment, this is actually way too hard for Bex to solve. And since I need my computer to be responsive in order to make this video, I'm gonna go ahead and just stop it right now. Let's scale the problem down and see what's happening. If we add one more character to our construction in J here, then it now says to insert the multiplication sign between the items of each prefix of the first 15 primes. That gives us a running product of primes, or the first 15 primorials. So one nice thing about this factoring problem is that we can scale it up and down just by picking a different number in this sequence. Let's look at 6. We need 3 bits to represent the number 6. I tend to round that up to a power of 2 and just call it a 4-bit number. Then we can ask, what are the 2-bit factors that multiply to give 6? Well, the factors are 1, 2, 3, and 6. And we just said we need 3 bits for the number 6, so that disqualifies the pair of 6 and 1. Um, but 2 and 3 fit into 2 bits each, so that pair is our only answer. Thankfully, Bex can solve this version of the problem in less than a second. In fact, it's one of the standard test cases. The code pretty much just calls the same macro we saw before, just passing in different numbers. This last parameter tells Bex whether or not to generate diagrams for debugging. It probably ought to be a command line flag, but for now, let's just change the test. So now we can see what Bex was thinking. First, this is how Bex represents the answer, at least when you ask for a BDD. It's actually pretty easy to understand once you know how to read it, but we're going to work our way up to that. This one is how Bex thinks of the problem statement. This is the part about the first number being less than the second, and this is the multiplication. Let's see how we got here. Part of the reason the factoring problem is so much harder for Bex is that the solver doesn't really know anything about math. But Bex does have a sort of translator, which lets you treat a list of expressions as if they were the bits in a number. Uh, it can also map operations on those numbers to the same sort of low-level operations that happen inside of a CPU. So for example, here we are asking Bex to multiply two two-bit numbers. As you can see, we give each bit its own identifier. This is how we present the factoring problem to the translator. Now when you want to multiply numbers with multiple digits, you multiply a copy of the top number by each digit of the bottom number and add the results. So here's the copy for x2. And now multiplying isn't exactly a Boolean operation. Uh, but since we're working in binary, x2 can only ever be 0 or 1. And in that case, multiplication has the same truth tables as the AND operator. So we can change this to an AND sign. 
So now we'll do the same thing for X3 on the next row, uh, remembering to shift it over one place and to append a zero. So now we've completely restated our factoring problem in terms of addition, uh, but we still don't have a Boolean expression. So let's go ahead and apply these AND operations. And now we have to actually add these two lines together. Well, adding zero to anything is the same as just copying it, so that's easy. To add these two bits, we need two steps. The result bit is the same as the XOR operation, or not equal to. That's because adding zero to anything keeps it the same, and adding two ones together gives you a two, but two is one zero in binary, so we put the zero down here, and then we carry the one. But we only carry when both the inputs are one, so we really carry the AND. At this point, if we were working with more than two bits in our numbers, we'd have to handle adding up to three bits vertically. And the translator knows how to do this, but we have a zero here, so we can just ignore it. Uh, and so again, we just do two bit addition. Uh, so XOR and then carry the AND. Now we have our four bit sum and we need to test whether it's equal to the number we're trying to factor, uh, which is six. It might be a little weird to see an equal sign here, but it actually is one of the 16 Boolean operations. It's the same as not XOR. When we compare each bit of our product to the bits in the number six, we'll get four new outputs. But in order to get a Boolean expression, we need a single output bit. So we have to AND all these results together in some way. This is the way Bex currently does it. So now we just have to figure out these slots. However, if we look at the truth table for equal, you'll notice that when you check for equality with one, it's the same as just copying. So we can connect these two bits of the product directly to the AND nodes. Likewise, an equality check with zero is the same as flipping the bit. And rather than allocating an extra node for the NOT operation, Bex handles that by setting a bit on the reference to this node. So we draw the edge as a dotted line instead of a solid one, and then these four equality check bits never actually appear in our graph. So now this graph represents the complete Boolean expression for testing whether two two-bit numbers multiplied together to get the number six. Um, and if we flipped it upside down and broke these four bits down one more step, you'd get a graph that looks pretty much like this. Feel free to pause the video if you want to double check. That leaves the less than condition. Rather than construct this, let's try to read the graph. This is the symbol for OR. So the expression is true when either of the linked conditions are true. So either not x3 and x1, so this bit is a 0 and this bit is a 1, or both of the following are true. These two are equal, not not equal, and x0 and not x2. So this is a 0 and this is a 1. Again, feel free to pause if you want to study this a bit. Put this graph together with the one about multiplying to get 6, fuse the duplicate nodes together, and you get this. Uh, so this right here is the complete description of the problem from Bex's point of view. Let's go back to the answer. This is called a binary decision diagram, or BDD. You can think of a BDD as a compressed truth table. One of the nice properties of BDDs is that just like a truth table, they're canonical representations. That means no matter what sequence of operations you use to convert this Boolean expression to a BDD, you will always get a graph that's equal to this one, provided you draw it with the variables in the same order from top to bottom. In contrast, there are an infinite number of things you could do to this graph on the left that would leave the truth table the same. For example, you could change this not XOR to just equals, or you could take multiple copies of this whole graph and AND them together. Deciding whether two Boolean expressions are equivalent is actually a really hard problem. In fact, it's pretty much the standard example of an NP-complete problem uh, in the form of satisfiability. You test whether or not an arbitrary expression is equivalent to the constant false. And if you wanted to use BEX as a SAT solver, you could generate a BDD and see whether or not it consisted of just the single node for false, which is this upward facing tax symbol. Now, I'm not actually going to explain how the BEX solver works in this video. It's not terribly complicated, but as we saw, it's slow, and there's a lot of work I need to do before it's worth talking about. And also, uh, it doesn't really matter how the solver works, since no matter what strategy we use to do the conversion, we always get the same BDD. So instead, I'm going to do what is probably the slowest possible conversion, just because it also happens to be the simplest. First, we're going to generate the complete truth table for our expression. The way to generate the truth table is to evaluate the expression for every combination of inputs. Since we want to treat this as two two-bit integers, we can also do the same thing in base 4. Now for each row, let's insert a less than sign. Uh, the bracket there is an identity function. It just separates the rank 1 symbol from the 4, 4. And we can use that same identity function to turn this back into a table uh, with a copy of the original input on the left. Uh, so now let's add a column to check whether the product is equal to 6. And then and these last two columns together. So now we have our truth table for integer inputs. Uh, let's convert it to binary and spruce it up a little. So give the original numbers a name and show them in binary off on the left. Uh, 
Let's get rid of the numbers in the middle. Uh, and then put a little header up top. Uh, well, I guess we'll call it E for expression. And so that's the, the final truth table. Okay, so here's the truth table next to the BDD. And the way to read it is just this. In a BDD, each one of these acts like an if-then statement. If x3 is zero, the dashed line, then the answer is false. And that's because when x3 in the truth table is zero, there is never a true answer. So we can just ignore all that uh, and we draw this line directly to false. Um, but when x3 is one, there is at least one true answer. So we have to go down to x2. And, and likewise for x2, when it's one, there's never an answer. So the high branch for x2 goes directly to false. And so we look at x1. Uh, and so when x1 is uh, one, there is an answer. When it's zero, there is no answer. So the low branch goes to false. The high branch goes to something else. Uh, and then we have one answer here. And so uh, when x0 is true, then the, the answer is true. And so this is just the function that represents x0 by itself. And so this path right here, this arrangement of variables, is the only one where it's true. So these inputs correspond to this path. And this is the answer in terms of input bits. So as I said, Bex does not use this brute force method of generating the whole truth table. Uh, it tries to be smarter, but it's a hard problem. And even though the truth tables are compressed as BDDs, and there are other representations I haven't shown you, the size of the uncompressed truth table grows exponentially. So if we go back to our original problem, we're dealing with 64 input bits. That means the truth table is 2 to the 64th power bits long. And that's another ridiculously large number. Now, each answer in a BDD is just a path from the top down to the true node. This one here only has one path, and so there's only one answer. We saw earlier that the solution for primordial 15 has 3,827 answers. So if Bex could solve that problem, the result would be a huge BDD with input bit x63 at the top and 3,827 branching and intertwining paths down to the true node. I don't know how many nodes that would be in total, but it would be a giant mess if you drew it on the screen. So you have to be really smart about making the conversion. Bex is smarter than brute force, but if you think of this series of primordials as a ladder to climb, well, Bex is currently down here. Now, 210 fits into 8 bits, and Bex can solve it for two 4 bit inputs in less than a second. That's actually one of the other standard test cases. But if you ask it to multiply two 8 bit numbers to get 210, then it takes 11 minutes. I haven't timed anything else, but everything up to 30,030 here is also an 8 bit multiplication, although you need 16 bits for the answer. The reason I haven't bothered to try any of the tests in between here is because I know I'm not going to get anywhere without a major improvement to the solving algorithm. Luckily, much better algorithms than what I'm using already exist. Uh, for example, I've been led to believe that the algorithms they use in SAT solving can already get me to this level here, and I hope to start incorporating some of those ideas into BEX in the future. And by the way, BDDs generally aren't used in SAT solving, although I've heard that there are a few solvers out there that are starting to incorporate them. For me, a, a BDD system was always just a way to learn a new programming language. But then I saw how fast I could make one go in Rust, and as I said before, it became an exercise in optimization. So far, my optimization efforts have mostly gone into the pure BDD part and not into the solving part. When I decided to have Bex factor this 15th primordial, I had no idea how long it would take. And it turns out I aimed high. But if it had been easy for Bex, I might not have ever shifted my focus from making a fast BDD system to making a fast solver. So even though this number was an arbitrary choice, it wound up causing a change in the way I thought about my program and became sort of a long-term goal for me to shoot for. So yeah, that's why Primordial 15 is my mega fave number. Uh, so thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again.